Hello, beautiful ladies. My name is Joyce Kelly, and I'm from the Carrollwood campus. And I pray that this message just speaks right to your heart. So, where have you stopped believing the promise of God for your life? Are you at a place where you're afraid to keep trusting because it's been so long? I get that. There's two areas of my life that I am waiting on promises that God spoke, and one is around my purpose that He spoke. I think we're going on 20 years now. And in that waiting, there's been, did I make that up? There's doubt. Maybe I missed it. Maybe I'm too old. I don't know if any of you can relate to that. And I remember one, just a few short years ago, telling God, I'll lay that down if there's something else you want me to do. And almost sternly, the Holy Spirit said, when did I ask you to lay that down? I said, okay. So just waiting on God. The other way that I'm waiting is for physical healing. It hasn't been 20 years. Maybe for some of you it is. It's been years. And as I thought about this message and was preparing about the doctors, the time, the money, the testing, only to get more diagnosis than just wondering, when am I going to find some relief when you're doing all the things? How do we keep moving forward? So what are you waiting on the Lord to do? What is that thing that seems impossible for him to do? You're just like, there's no way. Are you frustrated and weary? Have you stumbled into doubt that you'll ever see that thing come to be? I want to speak to the woman listening that has given up, that is frustrated and down, to the woman who's tired of waiting, that doubt has filled your life because maybe I missed God, maybe I misunderstood what he said, and maybe you've just given up. I want to speak to you, and I ask that the Holy Spirit right now, wherever you are, to breathe new life into that promise from God, that he would resurrect the promise in you that you would speak out of your mouth, I choose to believe God, I choose to trust your timing. And for the woman that feels like, I don't even have a promise from God, you do. It's digging in and finding what God has for you. There's a song that I've been listening on repeat as I'm waiting for my healing and, and some other things, and it's the song More Than Able. And maybe this is you. When did I start to forget all of the great things you did? That's what we can do while we're waiting is to remember the faithfulness of God. When did I throw away faith for the impossible? How did I start to believe that you weren't sufficient for me? In our waiting, God is more than sufficient to do everything he needs to do to get us to the promise that he has spoken over our lives. Why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? Ladies, God is more than able. Today, we're going to peer into the life of a woman who had to wait a long time. She stumbled along the way and made mistakes, but God. I'm talking about Sarah, the Sarah of Abraham and Sarah. She had to wait 25 years for the promise of a son. So who was she? She came from the pagan land of Ur. With Abraham, she left everything she knew to go to a place that God would show her. He didn't show them where they were going, but where they after they got there. What faith that took. She was the only woman in the Bible that God changed her name from Sarah, which means my princess, to Sarah, which means mother of nations. She carried the shame of not being able to conceive, and she lived in a culture which was shame and honor-based. Can you imagine? She's, God's given her this name, Mother of Nations, and she cannot conceive. The barrenness that she would bring this shame on her, the tears that she probably cried. I walked through three years of infertility. I can't imagine 25 years waiting for the promise. Her impatience and lack of belief led to consequences that changed the history, impacting nations and people today. Wow, that's a lot of pressure. So our text today is Genesis 18, verses 9 through 15. 
and I, the verse I want you to, and I hope the phrase that just resounds in your mind is anything too hard for the Lord. Why is waiting such a part of spirituality? Waiting is where faith actually becomes necessary. If God gives you a promise and the next day it happened, where's the faith? In the waiting and the silence is where faith grows. It's where we make those decisions to stand on the promises of God and to continue to move forward in all that he has for us. And then remember this, the presence of silence never equals the absence of God. Sometimes it can feel like God's left. <laughs> like, where are you, God? He's right there with you. He's right there with you. Waiting is found over 116 instances in the Bible, and Sarah wasn't the only one who waited. There was Joseph, Moses, David, Job, and you, and me. Chapter 18 opens up with the Lord and two angels paying a visit. This was a Christophany, which means it's pre-carnate, but a visible manifestation of the second person in the Trinity. So he was actually standing in front of them. That, that's pretty wild, but that's how God manifested his presence in the Old Testament. God had decided to visit with them, personally confirming what he had already promised many times. And it's an intimate picture where God sat and ate with Abraham for half a day, fellowshipping with him and surrounding him with his promise, with his presence. God wants to surround you with his promise with his presence. And so let's look at verse nine where Sarah comes into the picture and they say, where is your wife Sarah, they asked. It's not like they didn't know where she was, but they were drawing her into the conversation. He said, they're, they're in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you this time next year and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. It's been 24 years. Every interaction with them, God is reminding them of the promise. But this time it got very specific. In one year, you will have a child. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which had been behind them. Sarah and Abraham were already very old. And Sarah, well past the age of childbearing, so Sarah laughed to herself. She didn't say it out loud. She laughed to herself. I can't blame her. I would have I laughed too. This seems impossible. As she thought, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Like, she was in menopause. <laughs> like She was well beyond. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And then in verse 15, Sarah was um, afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh, which made me laugh <laughs> when we try to tell God, I didn't say that. He knows all things, but we do not have to be afraid of God knowing because he already knows. He wants us to acknowledge that in his presence, all is made known, all is better. In the presence and power of God, all is exposed. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God speaks, is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath life, which is soul, and the immortal spirit. That, wow. And the joints and marrow of the deepest parts of, of your nature, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. Exposure is necessary to weed out the unbelief, the fear, the frustration, or the expectations that God needs to be behave in a way that we think he should. And he is trustworthy in his presence, all is made known. So four lessons we can learn from Sarah. God will do what he promised. He is the God of the impossible. And somebody needs to hear that and be reminded of that over your situation. He is the God of the impossible. And God uses imperfect people. Sarah and Abraham are listed in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, and their story is not pretty or perfect. 
Thank goodness, because neither is mine. God accomplishes his will his way. Although Sarah tried to help God out with her plans, which was not a great thing, God's plans cannot be thwarted. You can't thwart God's plans for your life. God is faithful. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says, For as many as the promises of God, they all find their yes answer in him, Christ. For this reason, we also utter the amen, so be it. Say that out loud, so be it. To God, through him, in his person and his agency, to the glory of God. And two chapters later, we see Sarah laughing again, but this time she is holding her God promise. I mean, I want you to imagine that 25 years of faith, stepping out in what God has called her to do, the nights she probably cried, the shame she carried, the mistakes she made, God's promise, and she's holding her God promise. And some of you are holding your God promise, and you need to share your testimony for people that need that encouragement and that faith. Let this encourage you. And so when I thought I was just going to tie this message up in a pretty bow, the Holy Spirit said, you're not done yet. I said, okay. I want you to speak to the woman whose promise came packaged in a way she didn't like. She didn't want. She didn't ask for. Or maybe for some of you, you're having a hard time accepting. And kind of like this ugly package that I've had sitting here in front of me, It's hard to believe that anything of value is sitting inside of this. And I understand that because I am that woman, that I was believing for Ron's healing and it came packaged in a way I didn't want. But I'm here to tell you, five years later, after he's passed, there's beauty in the packaging. And so I want to share what was in it. Years ago, I was in a small group, and my dear friend Cheryl Anderson was in there. And what we would do is we would be um, take somebody's name, and we would pray for them for the week, and we would get a scripture and bring a trinket. Well, Cheryl brought this, which really isn't a trinket. And she said, I know it's not a trinket, but the Holy Spirit told me to bring this to you. And inside the scripture, she said, Joyce, God is going to ask you to pour out your life like a drink offering. And this was like 15 years ago, so it hit in that deepest place, but I didn't really know what she was talking about until a few years after Ron passed. This sits in my office, and sometimes I notice it, and sometimes I don't, and the Holy Spirit said, look, God asks us to pour out our lives as a sacrifice to service to others and worship to Him. And through walking through the last five years and the grief and understanding of sharing what I was learning and how God has moved. It's been a sacrifice, but I have seen the fruit from it. And he's no respecter of persons, and he's calling you to do the same thing as an act of worship to him. So three things that I have learned over the last five years is to wrestle well. And this journal is a journal that... um, that I used the first year after he passed, and it looks pretty much like this box. And there is scripture and truth and despair and questions, and we need to lament. And one thing that we need to know is in our deepest pain, there is no good Christian answer except lament. And it's not a word that we use a lot, but it's a word that God uses. Lament is prayer expressing sorrow, pain, and confusion. Lament should be the chief way Christians process grief in God's presence. Often we can hear that, um, just look on the bright side, or if we express our sorrow and our grief, does that mean we don't have faith? They can coexist. And we need to lament because it is in there when the promise comes packaged in a way we weren't expecting. It can almost seem jarring to lament, but it is so necessary. Why does God want us to lament? It leads us through our sorrows so that we can trust him deeper, 
and praise him more. What does the Bible teach about lament? Well, a lot, but the one thing I want you to know, lament turns towards God while sorrow tempts to run from God. Are you running from him? Bring all of your stuff into his presence and let him heal you. The second thing I've learned is to look for his glory in it and walk through it. And one of the most profound ways that I have seen God get the glory from our story, um, the eight-month battle, this is the journal that I used, the eight months standing on truth, and I had created this hashtag, truth to stand on. And I, even if I didn't believe it, I was standing on truth because I would tell people, don't ask me how I feel, ask me how what I know. And I had to stand on truth during that hard times. But through a series of events, Matthew West and Leanna Crawford wrote a song based on our story called Truth I'm Standing On, which only God could do. And when I heard the news that that song had been written, instantly I said, whenever anybody hears that song, they will find healing, they will find restoration, because I had to make some sense of it all. And Leanna created a music video. And as I watched the video, I sat and wept because I could see our story woven into the words of the song. And then at the end, this is crazy, only God. I saw this field that she was standing in and the field, there was sun beaming in and she's playing the piano, claiming truth I'm standing on. And guys, it's the same field that God would show me walking through. And what I've come to realize is the presence of God, where light beams in, where joy is found, where peace happens, and restoration is a promise. Only God. And the third thing I've learned is to become a valley guide. Use your deepest pain to minister to others, to grow in resistance, and to be a navigational map for the women to come out of that, to share our stories. And you might be sitting at tables right now. Look around the table. There are valley guides and there are people that need the way out. And maybe you're both. Maybe you're a valley guide because you've been through something and you need a valley guide because you're in the middle of something. You might be alone. You might be watching this alone or you might feel alone. And you might say, Joyce, I have no one. I want you to look in this camera, see my hand extending to you, and know that you can make it through, but you cannot do it alone. The testimony of others will inspire. Getting in the Word of God in His presence will help you walk out of that valley. At all the campuses, we're going to move into a time of prayer, and your sisters are going to stand up front. And what I want you to do is I just want you to go up and say, I've stopped believing the promise for restoration of my marriage or restoration of my health, my finances, the waywardness of my teenager, whatever that is. And they're just going to agree with you. And I pray that the power and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit falls now in the name of Jesus as you bring forth and agree together that you are going to rise up in the promise that God has given you. And then some of the words of that song is, who are we to deny what the Lord can do? Can you imagine with all the faith in the room that is stirring right now what the Lord can do? It's going to happen. Just let the way Make her through. Let your walls down and let the way make her through. There's so much goodness and grace, much more than we deserve, because I know who I am. I can't stay where I'm at. Let's declare that we will not stay where we're at. We've come this far by faith. We just can't turn back because he's not done with me and he's not done with you. There's so much more to your story. If you're breathing, there's more to your story. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Let's pray. God, we surrender all our fears, our doubts, the way that maybe a promise came packaged. And God, we surrender and we thank you. We pray for a revival of the promises that you've given us, that we would walk in faith, that you would strengthen us. In Jesus' name, amen.